Welcome to our services here today at Water's Edge. We believe that you're going to be touched by God. That's the whole purpose, is to believe that uh, the Lord is in our midst. Amen. That's kind of haughty to say that, right? You know, the God of the universe is that he's here. He yeah. loves us that much. He's here in our midst. And so we want to honor him and enjoy him. So we're going to open up with prayer before we go right into worship. And someone asked you if you would stand with me as we pray. Uh, we have been asked to pray for uh, a little uh, little boy, two-year-old Eli, who's in Children's Hospital. It's Mariah's nephew, I believe. And uh, so we've been asked to pray for uh, Eli. So let's do that in addition to uh, welcoming and honoring God's presence. Heavenly Father, what a beautiful day. And uh, Lord, every day is incredibly unique. And we realize that there's something very special about today because you're here in our midst and we are a people of faith. We just have expectation, God, because our faith in you is great because you're a great God. And we honor you and we bless you because you're the living God and you're in our midst. And we get to serve and worship and know the living God, the God of the universe. God, thank you for being so gracious. And every person here today, I pray that every person here today would know how special they are in your eyes. And that you see their life, you know exactly where they're at, what they need. Lord, for this young child, for Eli, we pray on his behalf. Lord, we ask that you would preserve and protect 
Tim, we ask that God that you would minister health and strength. We thank you for the incredible doctors and, and nurses and the, the facilities there, the, 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 the equipment and the medications. But God, you are the healer. And so we put our trust in Jesus. And we ask that you would touch this child in a, in a very dramatic way. But just the evidence of God's love. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Thank you for the privilege to pray. We ask all these things in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. 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 I, I want you to do, do me a favor. We, do, we want to welcome the Lord in this place. How do you welcome? How did you welcome people this morning when you saw them? I said, good morning. Through my kiss, I get, how about telling the Lord good morning? Good morning, Lord. Welcome into this place. Hallelujah. To know that he is here. Just as much as the person next, he's here more than the person next to you is. He's here every part of him. So the person next to you might be here physically. <laughs> but are they here mentally, emotionally, spiritually? Are they all in? Are they all, God is all in this morning. And look across the room, wave at a few people and say good morning. Good morning. All right, yeah, good morning. So uh, uh, it's good to have everybody here. And something that I was going to... Uh, Something I was going to mention in my message, I've got it in my notes here, but I just felt like we need to start with this in worship. Uh, the Lord is new every morning. Amen? Amen? He is new every morning. And old things are passed away. Now, I said that once. I think it was Shirley gave me a dirty look. I don't know why. But uh, <laughs> she's not here, so I keep saying that. No time. Okay? But uh, old things are passed away. All things. All means all or means nothing at all. All things are new again. And I want you to just walk into the presence of God saying, old things are gone. Yesterday, I, 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 your, your mind ever wandered back to years ago? And I found myself saying, Lord, I did something really stupid in high school. I'm so sorry. And he said to me, I don't know what you're talking about. Because it's gone. I asked forgiveness years ago, and Satan keeps trying to bring things like that back up to me, but it's gone. And so we're, we're going to recognize that. And you know what? Not only the things that, that you've been forgiven of, but the things you've misunderstood over the years. Ooh. The things that you've misunderstood over the years. God is saying old things are passed away. All things are new again. So we're going to hit the reset this morning. Yesterday, I, I, I was so thankful that the good gas mileage, I was getting on my truck, and then I went and picked up my camper and drove it over the hills to get home. And my gas mileage went, Pfft. And coming in today, something struck me. Reset. So I hit reset, and all of a sudden, I had, it showed me getting good, good gas mileage again. And it forgot what I did yesterday. And God is saying to you this morning, whether it's sin or whether it's wrong information, misunderstanding, bad teaching, whatever it is, let's hit the reset button right now. Let's start over and let's begin again. This morning, we are serving the everlasting God. So let's worship him as we sing this song.
I remember when the old time she's talked about tarrying? Waiting before the presence of the Lord tarry. Let me ask you, how long has it been since you just waited before the Lord? Did you tarry? Say, like, Lord, make me who you want me to be. That's what he wants to do today. Let's tarry before him. We're going to worship him today. We're going to expect great things from the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He wants to build you in the food. Is designed you to be. Let's worship in this world.
Word. 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 Oh, holy, holy, holy.
will stop him. Nothing will stop him. All it takes is surrender. Just surrender to him. And this morning, as we celebrate the gifts of the Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit in us coming out in gifts for others. Let's make sure the Holy Spirit knows that he's welcome, not only in this place, but this place. Hallelujah.
awareness and that's really how he's kind of responded for those who may be the guests here with us today uh, Pastor Rusty I will be talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit but that's what we just experienced prophetic words where people have a sense of what God is communicating to us today it's, it's kind of a now word for us it doesn't add to the Bible it should go along with the Bible but uh, obviously God is telling us we have asked and he's acknowledging he's here he's here in our midst we can enjoy his presence. We can enjoy a heavenly reset in our lives yes. where the things are kind of cleared away yes. and uh, all things are new in Christ. And I'm not uh, I'm not held captive to what happened yesterday or last year or, or 30 years ago. God is in our midst. And you know, we as people, um, we, we have a tendency to kind of wander. Just like the, you know, the children of Israel, they wandered in the desert. And it wasn't just a physical thing. Their heart wandered from the Lord. And we all, we, we tend to wander. Uh, there's a proverb, I think Proverbs 21, 16 says, He who wanders from, under, from God's understanding will rest in the abode of the dead. You know, if, we, if we wander too much, we can wander away from the things of God and just be a, a part of our world. So let's, let's just uh, pray and just believe the Lord that he'll... Bring us back. Yes. He'll bring bring back those those wandering. You know, sometimes we have wandering thoughts, wandering desires. He'll bring us back to His place, yes. that yes. holy reset, to what God is saying. And you know, He doesn't uh, He doesn't hold us. You know, say no, it's too late. No, you. No, no. It's it's all about coming back to the Lord. So let's just uh, set in our hearts. We we want the things of God. Heavenly Father, thank you for your incredible. The loving kindness of God, Lord, you're so gentle, so patient, and uh, Lord, you don't overlook our sins, but you call us to change our ways, to turn our eyes towards you, and Lord, for every one of us here today, where maybe we've wandered from something you called us to do, we've wandered from the truth of the gospel, we've wandered from your kingdom principles, and have allowed the the world, the, the media, whatever, to take us in a different direction. A different direction, Lord. We just want to set our hearts today on you. We want your presence. We know that there is no position, there's no person, there's no no amount of prosperity that compares to the presence and the peace of God. Living for you, walking with you, doing your will. So today, Lord, we acknowledge your presence here. And we declare, Lord, we want the ways of God. We want your heart. So open up our eyes today in a brand new way. And Lord, we have called, you have responded as the prophetic word says. And so Lord, today we receive 
your presence. We receive your mercy and grace today. We honor you, Lord, and we bless your name. And we ask these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. on what you see around you, and that is not the answer. Spend time with me, hear my word, yeah. and see through my eyes. It is done. Yeah. 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 Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Well, Lord, again, we just respond. Your, your word says the, yes, the, the, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made the most. So, Lord, open up our eyes to see yeah. through your eyes. Yeah. God, that we would hear yeah. your voice. We hear that gentle voice, and we would uh, just purpose to spend time listening and waiting for you today, Lord. Thank you, so much, Lord. Thank you for the Lord for your comfort. Thank you for ministering to us and speaking to us. We receive those things today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. We will go ahead and uh, this time dismiss children and all the children's workers to go back for children's ministry. Uh, I want to just remind you that tonight, uh, being the third Sunday, it's ladies only tonight. Susan Ash will be sharing at 5 o'clock right here in the fellowship area. Also, 5 o'clock, the current youth will be meeting tonight uh, as well. Pastor Rusty, 5 o'clock. Tuesday will be a reap captain's tables, the small group at Water's Edge at 6 o'clock on Tuesday. And then next uh, next Saturday is, a, is kind of a big day for us. It's the Easter egg stuff. Please join us as we help stuff eggs for the Easter egg hunt. Easter's going to be here, wow, real quick. Two weeks from today, right? That's not right. The two weeks from today, wow, it's Easter. So please join us. We, and we do want to make, as we mentioned last week, uh, about the camp. Camps are coming up, and boy, what a rich time for young people to encounter God at our camps. There's been so many testimonies of so many young people, children up through the teens that have been um, dramatically impacted by camps. So we recognize that $285 may be difficult financially, but because of the generous giving of our church family, Water's Edge has set aside funds to help cover part of the cost of camps. So please don't let that be a detriment. If you need help, we would love to help you. Our state youth director has indicated this year camp capacity is 495. This is about 100 less than we normally have a tent camp. Because of this limitation, we'll be asking all who currently have requested spots for any youth camp to please have your deposit down on your spot. Uh, you need uh, no later than March 26th. That's coming real quick. That's Friday, right? Yeah. Uh, this will help us to know our actual numbers to ensure every student can attend camp, any spot in your church. ID with a deposit of $50 will be released to other churches waiting for open spots. So we need to know by March 21st, which is today. <laughs> so it's uh, if you want to go and if you want your young people to go, uh, just very, very powerful time. So please, uh, please avail yourself of that. Pastor Rusty. And I don't want to over labor. Over labor, is that a way to put it? I don't know. Uh, I don't want to Overstate, but I don't know if I can overstate the importance of a young person going to camp. If if uh, if you've got a young uh, a young person in your life that you have no complaints about, Lord bless you. <laughs> but those things will be addressed at camp. Their, their life will be changed, and it's not about waiting and deciding. It's about making a decision. I, I tell pastors, I meet with pastors all the time. One of my questions is. When's the last time you went on vacation? And painfully so, many of them say, well, we got away for a weekend a year and a half ago. And it's like, no, if you don't plan it, it's not going to happen. And if you don't plan for your children to go to camp, it's not going to happen. And when, if, invariably, the folks that come to me after the fact say, why, why is this happened? It's like, you didn't plan you got a plan. You got a you got a schedule. So if, if 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 there's a child in your life that needs to go to camp, then you need to talk to us today. We need to get things set up. Okay. That said, oh, and also for those that helped with uh, with yesterday outside, we did some some work on the 
the uh, uh, the flower beds and things. Thank you so much. There's some folks that came and helped with shampooing more carpet. So we've got we everything except the sanctuary and my office. I think <laughs> has been uh, and, oh, in the youth room has been the carpet has been shampooed. It's all clean. We, we're getting uh, uh, we're, we're getting people that are bringing estimates in for recarpeting the platform while they're doing it. We're telling them all go ahead and give us a price on the floor carpet because it's, it's been around for a while. So we're going to see what we can do here. Finishing, upgrading everything and getting to that point. Why? Because God's presence comes to us here. And though we could, we could be meeting in a, in a barn and his presence would still come here, but we want to, we want to do our best. We want to invite him into a place where we can say, Lord, this, we've set aside this place in this time for you and for your spirit. And as we said today, old things have passed away. All things are new again. And as I mentioned, as was mentioned in the prophetic word, God has spoken to our hearts. He has pressed the reset button. He wants us to get a new understanding and the title of the message this morning, hopefully we'll go along with that. The title is, No Need to Fear the Gifts. And I want to tell you this morning, there is no need for you to fear the gifts that God gives to you. We've all seen the movies of a genie in a bottle where you rub it, the genie comes out and says, what do they say? I'll give you three wishes. Three wishes. Okay, I know this isn't scriptural. Please don't beat me up for this. It's just an illustration. But I'll, I'll give you three wishes. And so the person inevitably asks for something that turns out to be bad, right? That I want a million bucks and all of a sudden a bunch of bucks come running in and trample them to death. You know, or something like that. And, and in the midst of this, we need to understand we serve a good father. And if man being evil, you all... You all don't sit there and think, ooh, how can I mess over my child today? <laughs> if you do, Jesus help you. You're messed up. <laughs> you don't do that. And God doesn't either. And if man being evil desires to give good gifts to his children, how much more does our Heavenly Father desire to give good gifts to his children? So there is no need to fear the gifts. And this morning we're going to take a look at that, but I want, we're, going to, we're going to reset our minds right now. However you thought the Holy Spirit did things before, he's saying, let me start over with you. We're going to, we're going to check everything at the door, and we're going to start fresh. So Father, in Jesus' name, clear our minds. Father, may we walk into this time with a mindset of, I don't know anything. All my experiences have been forgotten. A fresh canvas for you to write on, for you to paint. Lord, today, make our lives into the work of art that you desire us in Jesus' name, amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul says, my friends, you ask me about spiritual gifts. Well, I want to tell you about it. He says, I want you to remember that before you became followers of the Lord, you were led in the wrong ways by idols that cannot even talk. Now, that was back before media or current media. I think now we could say, you have been led by idols that are even talking. They're coming through a speaker. They're coming through, through a screen. Those on says, now I want you to know that if you are led by God's Spirit, and this is the key, if you are led by God's Spirit, you will say that Jesus is Lord. I want everyone here to, I want to make sure we're all on one page. With me, we're going to say Jesus is Lord together. One, two, three. Jesus is Lord. All right. 
I like it. Let's do that again. That was good. One, two, three. Jesus is Lord. All right. And you will never curse Jesus. Never. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts. We're going to be talking about that today. We're going through the, the nine that are, that are listed here. But let me tell you, the list of spiritual gifts, I have come to the realization that there are spiritual, there, there are gifts that aren't necessarily outlined anywhere. But for the moment, God says, you know what, I'm going to give my child this. I'm going to, I'm going to put this into them. So that they can do what needs to be done. I, I guess they're, maybe they're spiritual tools. Okay? So there are different kinds of spiritual gifts. But they all come from the same spirit. That's important. There are different ways to serve the same Lord. And we can each do different things yet. The same God works in all. Look at your neighbor and say all. There's that word again. All means all or it means nothing at all. The same God works in all of us. Oh, but Pastor Rusty, you're the pastor, so you're the one that's supposed to do it. Wait, no. It doesn't say the same God works in all pastors. It doesn't say that the work of God, the, the, the God works in all of the Sunday school teachers or all of the evangelists or all of the prophets. He says the, word, work, the same God works in all of us. And not only does he work in us, it says, and helps us. Aren't you glad for that? Even when I step out, he works in me and says step out. And when I do, he helps me. And helps us in everything. That's a huge word. Everything we do. Ooh. Verse 7. This is, they grab, chew this one up. The Spirit has given each of us a special way of serving others. You want to know my. My friends, you ask me about spiritual gifts, verse 7. The Spirit has given each of us a spiritual or a special way of serving others. I like the New American Standard Version. It says, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So he says, my friend, you ask me about spiritual gifts. Here is, here is the, the crux, the core of what spiritual gifts are. Now, I'm just, I'm going to tag team with Pastor Rick. We've never done this before, and I need to make sure I leave him some time, so let's keep going. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26. Again, he says, my friends, when you need to worship, or oh no, when you meet to worship, how many of you know you need to worship whether you feel like it or not? Worship is, I mean, have there been times you told someone you loved them and you really didn't feel it, but you knew it was true? Oh, come on. Let's be honest. You may, if, if you nod your head too much, too hard, too frequently, you might get an elbow. But there's times when we love people, we tell them we love them, even though we don't feel it because we know it's true. It says, my friend, when you meet to worship, you must do everything for good of everyone there. That's how it should be. Let me say that again. Do everything for the good of everyone there. That's how it should be. When someone sings or teaches or tells what God has said or speaks an unknown language or explains what the language means. Why? We're doing this, these two words, for the common good and for edification. That's what the Holy Spirit is about. Now, if you get a pro prophet that's a harsh prophet, they're an Old Testament prophet, and they don't belong in the New Testament church. Is that right, Pastor Rick? 
Old Testament prophets came in and he pointed, remember Nathan pointed his bony finger at David? And he, he, first he told him a story about a guy that had a, a, one little lamb. He was a poor guy, and they loved the lamb. It was like part of his family. The rich guy next door with all kinds of sheep had a buddy coming in for a meal, and he didn't want to slaughter one of his lambs, so he took the lamb from the, the poor man and slaughtered it and fed his buddy. And when he told him the story, David said, that guy needs to die. We need to go after him. And Nathan pointed his bony finger at David and said, you're the man. That's the Old Testament prophet. The Old Testament prophet said, gloom and everything bad is going to happen because you're such a bad group of people. That's the Old Testament prophet. The New Testament is for the common good and for edification, lifting up. And the gifts of the Spirit, unfortunately, though, have been targets of exploit. Anybody seen the Holy Spirit being misused in your life and you've been in a Pentecostal church for any length of time? I'm the only one? Okay. It's just me. <laughs> but it's been happening from the beginning. Remember the story of, of Simon the Magician. Simon the Magician had made a lot of money and he was well known. He was popular. People watched him because he was a magician. Watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. You know, and people loved that and they were mesmerized by his magic. And one day, we the story tells us that, that Philip came to his area. Simon sees the miracles that are taking place. He hears the, the story of the gospel, and he says, I want that. So he, he surrendered his life. He got saved. He came in. He's seen these miracles happen. And what do you know? After that, Peter and John came on the scene, and they laid hands on people. And people, all of a sudden, you know, and, and here's, here's this Simon's just watching all this. And Peter and John, the important man, they come and they, they lay hands on people. And all of a sudden, he sees a power. Simon sees a power coming on the people. He sees their lives changing. He hears them speak in an unknown language, and he knows in his heart, this is real. And he goes to them and he says, man, this is incredible. I want this power to lay hands on people and them to receive this incredible gift. I'll pay you money. Listen to what he's told. Peter said to him, you and your money will both end up in hell. Oh, that's harsh. If you think you can buy God's gift, you don't have any part in this. And God sees that your heart isn't right. Get rid of these evil thoughts and ask God to forgive you. I can see you are jealous and beyond you and, and, and bound by your evil ways. And Simon said, please pray for the Lord so that you may, uh, so that what you said won't happen to me. And I know we were talking about harshness. This wasn't a gift of the Spirit coming forth. This was just the fact that he saw this. Now let me ask you something. They saw, this was the beginning. The Spirit was moving in a new way. And anytime there's something new, there's, God is, is, more detail-oriented and expecting us to be. That's why Ananias and Sapphira, the whole thing there, I don't want to get into that. There again, i got to give Pastor Rick some time. I'm only in my first page. So, but uh, uh, as we look at this story, what would happen if someone came into our church and saw Pastor Rick or I lay hands on someone and something incredible and miraculous happened and that person came up and said, hey, I'll pay you to, to give me the opportunity. I want to do this. I'll pay you whatever it takes. And we looked at him and said, you and your money are going to hell. You think somebody after church would be coming to me and say, Pastor, you're wrong. That was terrible. And his response, pray for me. Please pray to the Lord so that what you said won't happen to me. Or would that person, boom, and out the door. What? Listen to me this morning. The problem is, though the gifts are available, people bring flesh into them. And even when you're doing what's harsh, but you're doing what's supposed to be done, people feel like the Lord is speaking to them when in actuality it's themselves. 
and they bring flesh in. We've got to be careful of that. Unfortunately, that goes into the, the, the gifts of the Spirit. Some I've said it before, some of the most evil people I've ever met spoke in tongues. And you say, that shouldn't be. You're right. That should not be. But that doesn't make spiritual gifts wrong. That's why it's so important that they're understood and used correctly for the common good and for edification. And this morning, uh, I haven't even talked, I, I added this into my notes after you got it, so you don't know what I'm going to say here, because God spoke something to me yesterday. Uh, I've, I, I mentioned the worship team here this morning, hey, and they'll testify to this. Some of them looked at me like, what? <laughs> I said, look, I'm, I'm changed. God spoke to me about changing changing things about me. One of them is how I lead. Remember when I when I did the series on change? I mentioned that. And I looked at it and said, so I'm going to be doing some things in the worship team. And if I say something that hurts your feelings, please come and tell me. And then get over it. Because my job is to make you better. And make the worship better. And this morning, I want to tell you, my gifting as, as a shepherd, as the pastor of the church, my gifting is to help you find your gifting and find the sweet spot in that. That means that, that, uh, that there's, that means that from this point on, I'm determined. I'm not looking to hurt people's feelings that I'm going to have to speak some things that will be hard for me to say and hard for you to hear. But I want to preface it by saying I'm only saying what I know that I know that I know that God is speaking into my heart. Now, there's a chance, is there a chance that I might step off the edge and go into the flesh? Da -da -da. Yeah, that could happen. And when it does... I, I, want, I want you to come to me and let me know. And I'll pray through it and you'll pray through it. Whether I've stepped off or I haven't and you're just hurt either way, please do me a favor. Get over it. Okay? I want to start impl implementing something here. I, I believe the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. A 24-hour rule. You're allowed to be mad at me for 24 hours. I'm allowed to be mad at you for 24 hours. But then we both have to get over it and move on. Because we're the kingdom of God. And it hinders the spirit from doing what he wants to do. So, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. Each of you has been blessed with one of God's many wonderful gifts. Each of you has been blessed with one, at least one, at least one, of God's many wonderful gifts, be sure so uh, to be used in the service of others. So use your gift well. If you have the gift of speaking, preach God's message. If you have the gift of helping others, do it with the strength that God supplies. Everything should be done in a way that will bring honor to God because of Jesus Christ, who is glorious and powerful forever. Amen. So, what are the gifts? That's what we're, I've said all that to come to this. This is the, the message today. What are the gifts? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8. Some of us came speaking with wisdom, while others came speaking with knowledge. But these gifts come from the same Spirit. To others, the Spirit is given faith, or the power to heal the sick. Or the power to work mighty, mighty miracles. Some of us are prophets. And some of us recognize when the Spirit is present. That's the sermon. Others can still uh, uh, can speak different kind of languages. And still others can tell what these languages mean. But the Spirit who does all this and decides which gift to give to each one. It is the Spirit who, who does all this and decides which gift to give to each of us. So 
So there are nine primary. As I said, there, there's an expansive list. This gives us the primary list that we start to work from. The first, I'm going to be taking the first couple of them. Then Pastor Rick will be stepping in. But wisdom. Wisdom. We, if there was every day we need wisdom. It's today. Wisdom, the spiritual capacity to apply spiritual knowledge effectively. James chapter 3 verse 17 says, But the wisdom that comes from above leads us to be, not leads us toward, but leads us to be. This is what the Spirit gives us. Wisdom comes, gives us to be pure, friendly, gentle. Sensible, kind, helpful, genuine, and sincere, so that we can bless others. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. We have not stopped praying for you since the first day we heard about you. In fact, we always pray that God will show you everything. He wants you to do and that you will have all the wisdom and understanding that his spirit gives. Then you will live a life that honors the Lord and you will always, always please him by doing good deeds. You will come to know God even better through this gift of wisdom. His glorious power will make you patient and strong enough to endure anything. And you will truly, you will be truly happy. Isn't that what God wants for our lives? Not a partial happiness, not a fake or a facade happy, but you will be truly happy. That's what wisdom brings. Knowledge. Receiving from the Spirit of God information that you could not know on your own. Anybody experience that? Information, yeah, God does. It. I've mentioned it before. Uh, I won't go into the whole story, but a young man who was messing up his life terribly, and the principal calls me as his probation, juvenile probation officer, and I go down to her office, and she's just not. David, you're not, you're, you're not, you're not. He's like, I don't care, I don't care, I don't care. And she keeps looking at me like, are you going to step in, Mr. Probation Officer? And I just stood there blank. She didn't know it, but I was praying. Finally, everything got quiet. She looked at me and she said, are you going to say anything? And the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and I looked at him and I said, David, when's the last time you saw your sister? And I thought, God, I hope he has a sister. <laughs> I had 80, over 80 kids I was responsible for. God, I hope he has a sister. And it looked like I hit him upside the head with a ball bat. And his eyes teared up and he looked at me and he said, last time I saw her, she was getting off of a bus walking to somebody's house as I was hiding in the bushes because dad went off his meds. He's paranoid schizophrenic and he kicked me out of the house and told me if I come near him or her, he'd kill me. And I've been living in cars that people leave unlocked and trying to come see. And as he's crying, as the principal's crying, and as I'm crying, she said, David, I wish you would have told us this sooner. We're, we're going to fix this. And she got him straightened up and sent him back, and she looked at me after he left the room, and she said, when's the last time you saw your sister? Where did that come from? And I said, the Holy Spirit spoke, and that's all I knew. And she was like, oh. We'll get into more of that in just a minute. Jesus operated in the Word of God. John chapter 4, verse 7. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. She said to him, basically, the story impressed down. She said, you're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. Why are you even speaking to me? And Jesus said, you should ask me for a drink of living water. This well will leave you thirsty, but the water that I have cut will come up from within you and will always be there. And she said to him, then give me this water. And she said, he said to her, bring me your husband. Is that weird? I want to give you water. I've got water that will change your life. It will come up from within you. It will never go dry. She says, give me the water. She says, bring me your husband. She said, uh, uh, sir, I had no husband. 
Jesus said to her, you have correctly said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you have now is not your husband. This, this you have said truly. And she said, sir, I perceive you are a prophet. The word of knowledge. You want to get somebody's attention? Let the Spirit of God flow through you in that. When we express information that we couldn't know on our own, people recognize that fact and are ready to listen to the word. Pastor Rick, if you'll pick up on faith. Thank you, Pastor Rusty. And uh, Josh, if you can go to the, uh, skip that first slide and go to 1 Corinthians 12, 9, would be where I'll pick up. There we go. Very good. Uh, just a reminder, as, uh, as we're kind of reading this letter, Paul is, is writing the letter to a, a spirit-filled community. I know there's kind of different, some different thoughts in terms of our culture today and religion today about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and baptism of the Holy Spirit. But remember the context that Paul is writing to the first, the first church. They were a spirit-filled church. They were spirit-filled people. This was not something foreign to them. <laughs> Uh, there were some problems in the Corinthian church. They were very spiritual, but also they had some they had some real problems with kind of carnality, and there was disorder. But it's, it's interesting, as much as they were being used by God in the gifts, although they had some problems, he didn't say, hey, you guys are just really overemphasizing the gifts. Way too much emphasis. We need to tone it down. He doesn't say that. He doesn't tell them to stop using them. He just brings proper order to how those gifts are to, are to be used. So he's and he's not just instructing them. We also know that you know the Bible is written to us, right? It was written to those Corinthians or written to the Romans, but it's written for us. So it wasn't just for back then, two thousand years ago. It's for today. It's for all of us. Or else, God kind of wasted three whole chapters in First Corinthians because chapter twelve is all about the gifts. Thirteen is how to be motivated by love, and fourteen is about how the, how they should be ordered within the church within a church meeting. Right? So why would we have three whole chapters that were just for people 2,000 years ago? It really wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. So it has to be for us today. And in spite of all the abuses and problems, we're told at least a couple times, and we'll probably look at those verses this morning, that we are to actually desire spiritual gifts. We're told to desire. It's okay to ask for spiritual gifts. And we want to keep them in balance. We don't want to just seek the gifts. We want to seek God. But we're told to desire spiritual gifts. So we should all uh, have that, that inner desire uh, for, the, for the gifts to operate in our lives. So 1 Corinthians 12, 9 says, to another, I don't have time to get into it, but there's a, there's a change up in the language here. A lot of times people teach the gifts, they'll teach them three, three, and three. There's three different categories that they'll break them up into. But really, the, if you read through the, the, the grammar here, he introduces the, the two, the five are lumped together, and then there's the last two. And that's kind of how Pastor Rusty and I are doing it today. So in verse 9 it says, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same spirit. So these two gifts, when we talk about the gift of faith, obviously there's different types of faith in the Bible. There's a faith, what we call a saving faith. Ephesians, I think Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, for by grace are you saved through faith. So God actually gives everybody in this room today, in, in this room here this morning, that has a personal relationship with God through Jesus at some point in time in your life, God gave you the faith to believe. Now, you still had to make the choice. It wasn't just God did the whole thing. But he had to actually give you saving faith, the ability to be able to see spiritual reality and make a decision to serve Jesus. So that's what we call saving faith. And then once we're saved, uh, Romans 12, I think in verse 3, talks about that God has given every believer the measure of faith. So at our conversion, God then makes a deposit in our spirit and he actually gives us a, a faith, and it, but it, we have to develop that faith. Sometimes we look at certain people, we go, man, I wish I could be like them. I, I wish I had their faith. I wish I, well, everybody starts with the same measure. Right. You have to develop your faith. You have to develop it. You have to, you have to nurture it. We have to spend time in the Word. We have to spend time with the Holy Spirit. We have to spend time in the things of God and nurture that faith. And so there's a, the, the saving faith, the measure of faith we're given. Um, James chapter 2 talks about that they had come to a mature faith. Uh, Jesus one time talked about, the, I think it was the centurion, he said, I've not seen such great faith in the land of Israel. He was a Gentile guy. Woo -hoo, one of us, right? He was a Gentile. Uh, now, we've seen the Jews, but I'm just saying, he, he, you know, he, was, he was a guy that 
Jesus elevated uh, among all the people in Israel. We can have a growing faith. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 talks about that we, we should have a growing, abounding faith. It should be constantly growing. We know faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Okay? So we can all develop our own. But that's not the faith he's talking about right here. He's talking about one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I like what Pastor Rusty said that, you know, this is not the list. This is a list. He doesn't say, the, here's, here's the nine manifestations of the Holy Spirit. That, no, no, no. This is, these are examples. There's so many, there's so many gifts. You know, and the Bible tells us that every gift comes from God, whether it's a spiritual gift or a natural gift. You know, someday, uh, you know, Michael Jordan, you ever heard of Michael Jordan? Today? He'll give an account for how he used that natural gift. Pretty great gift, but it came from God. And so he'll give it. So if you're, you're, you have a great actor, you have a great politician, great military leader. All of those are gifts, whether they're spiritual or natural, they all come from God, and we'll all give an account for how we've used those. And so I, I, too, I try to, I try to, to formulate a definition. So when we talk about the spiritual gift of faith, the Holy Spirit of faith, I wrote down, it's faith given to an individual by the Holy Spirit to further God's purposes that supernaturally trust and does not doubt. Now that's kind of still kind of long, but I try to hone it down. <clears throat> but it's a God will give you, you will just know, you will just supernaturally know if something's going to happen or something's not going to happen, right? That's just a gift of faith. God will give you the faith, and that faith can receive a miracle, can receive a healing. It's a very powerful, very powerful gift. But I like, I heard this illustration a long, long time ago. It's sort of like, you, you ever notice how you, you, I know we got some truck drivers in the Dan drive truck. Some of you see a truck going down the road, and it's got this big tanker, you know, this gasoline tanker, we'll say BP or something. And that truck's pulling that, and we all know that truck's probably going to go to a gas station someplace and deposit that gasoline for you and I to use. But as that truck's driving along, it's not using the gas in that big tanker. It's got its own little private gas tank that runs its engine. That gasoline, that big tank is for other people. And so when God gives you and I the gift of faith to believe something, it's usually for other people. The gifts are for the church. They're for the prophet of all. They're not, you know, God can give me wisdom, right, for my own life. If I ask, James says, if I ask, I'll receive. But the, the wisdom Pastor Rusty was talking about, that's a wisdom for somebody else. That's a word of knowledge for somebody else. And this is a gift of faith for somebody else. It brings about a miracle. It takes impossibilities and makes them possible. It creates an atmosphere, especially when you release that. You say, I believe God said this is going to happen. It tends to elevate the faith of everybody in the room. So it's a very, 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 very powerful gift, the gift of faith. Secondly, the gift of, uh, gifts of healing. Actually, in the, the Greek, it's plural, but it's gifts of healings. And that there's many different diverse ways that God heals, many different types. And, and, and you notice in the body of Christ, there are certain people, and over the years at Boston, there are certain people that have certain abilities, you know, they'll have certain, I've heard people talk about that they had just great faith for heart problems. Or some people had great faith for back problems. And there are just certain meetings where a lot of people get healed with having a back problem. A lot of people get healed having a heart problem or some other, you know, blind people. You know, typically you read about that in other countries. But there are certain graces and anointings that people have to minister. So this is uh, the gift of he gifts of healings are supernatural enablements. Again, this is the supernatural. It's God doing it. Enablement to heal the sick and restore health without the use of natural means. Now, we all know what it's like to go to a doctor and get medication, or tell, we're told, hey, don't do this anymore, or you need to do this, and it'll bring restoration to our body. And again, every good and perfect gift comes from the Heavenly Father. So whether it's a natural way of getting healed or a supernatural, it all comes from God. But this is not dependent upon doctors, not dependent upon medication. And all of us as believers... Right? All of us can pray for the sick. I mean, we're all called to do that. But there are times where God will give a grace to someone to super, they'll, they'll either recognize or they'll, they'll just sense that God's going to heal that person. They'll pray and they will be healed. And so the person is not the, the, does, is not the healer. God is the healer. But he uses us as instruments of his mercy and grace to bring about a healing. Next verse. 1 Corinthians 12.10 says, to another, 
a working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning a spirit. So let's look at the working of miracles. Here's a working definition of that. It's the supernatural enablement to intervene in the ordinary course of nature to do something that would not happen naturally. And some examples would be, now sometimes people get prayed for, you know, they have a, a physical ailment or problem, and they get prayed for, and they get healed immediately, right? Well, that's not just a healing, because healing is typically a process. Sometimes people, you know, Jesus would minister to people, he'd tell them, you know, go, go do something, go wash in the pool of Siloam, go whatever, uh, go show yourself to the priest. He would make them walk that out, and the healing would be a process. But when you pray for someone and they're healed instantly, that's actually the working of miracles and healings working together. So healings, uh, somebody that's raised from the dead, right? That, that, would be, that would be a miracle. In the natural, it's a miracle. Uh, someone that's been uh, delivered from a demon. You know, exorcism, have you ever read about or seen one? Or uh, I've been a part of some of those. It's uh, not a fun thing, but it's a real thing. I'm just telling you, it's very, very, very real. You know, when Moses with the ten plagues in, in Egypt, that, those were all miracles, right? When Moses stood at the Red Sea and part of the Red Sea, that was a miracle. It was a miracle of God. When Jesus walked on the water, that was a miracle, right? And, you know, Peter set the human record for walking on water. And we all talk about him, uh, him, him, you know, going down and didn't make it the whole way, but has anybody beat his record? I mean, I don't care if it was one foot or two feet. He, there's nobody else that's ever done that that I'm aware of. I'm sure someplace, some, in some country, somebody has, has got But for, for our accounts, Peter has the, has the record. Uh, Philip performed miracles, right? Stephen, and these, these guys weren't, the, weren't apostles, right? So the work of miracles, God can work through anybody. All of us should have that expectation that God can use me. If I'll make myself available, God can use me to work a miracle. Next, we'll talk about the, the spiritual gift of prophecy. Um, we've actually experienced that here today. And prophecy, one simple way to look at it, it's a supernatural utterance in a known tongue. All right, we had messages today from God, but they were all in English. Another way to look at it is, at it is the spiritual ability to receive and communicate an immediate message of God to his people. And that's what we experience today is people stepped out in faith. They brought a now word. This is what God is saying to us right here, right now, that applies to our individual lives right here in 2021. So that was a, a now word. It's usually unplanned. It's usually something spontaneous. Uh, most people that are given prophetic words, well, just all of a sudden they just feel they got something from the Lord. They just all of a sudden, they're just an inner knowing, right? There's an inner knowing. It's almost like they've got a word of knowledge. Again, the gifts work together. But there's a blending, but it's it's not something they plan. Uh, it should not contradict. It doesn't add to scripture. It's not it's not weighted as the same as scripture. That's why we're told to judge when prophetic words. We don't judge the person, but we judge the word. Is it is it right? Does this rightly agree with scripture? And if it does, it hey, they're, you know we're human beings. We always say you know God is perfect, His word is perfect, but you and I as human beings we are imperfect. And so that's whenever somebody has something for the Lord, we always evaluate it. We always look at that word and make sure that it lines up with Scripture. Is it something that's, that's you know, going along with what God's heart already is, has been revealed to us? So it's, again, to be examined by us as believers. We don't just take it hook, line, and sinker. We, we look at, what did he say? Does that, does that, does that, does that line up? Um, and actually, it's considered a very, very, prophetic words are, are very, very powerful words because they can affect a whole group of people. And so they have a power. I know in my own life I don't have time to share, but I've received some prophetic words over the last 30, 40 years that dramatically changed my life. Because they brought an awareness of what God was saying. And maybe, you know, go to God and say, God, is that true? Is that really? Is that, is that what, is what they said to me? And it may be search. It may be wait upon the Lord. And that's what the idea is. All these gifts are to point us to the Lord, not to people. Uh, not to not to abilities, but a point is to the Lord. So we examine it by the word, and it has tremendous influence. First Corinthians 14 1. First Corinthians 14 1 says, Pursue love. Is that right there? Yeah. Uh, pursue love, desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Interesting verse because that first part just um, 
just summarize um, chapter 13. Chapter 13 is all, you know, the, the love chapter. Just that everything should be motivated by love. So we're told to pursue love. And notice it's not defining love as a feeling. Uh, feelings are okay and they're all part of love. But I can't pursue a feeling. Right? Love does something. For God so loved the world that he, he gave. Right? He did something for us. He saw us in our problem and just didn't say, well, gee, tough luck, you guys. You know, Adam and Eve, they blew it, so you're all... No, no, He's, he did something about it. He, he remedied the problem. So we're to pursue love. We are to desire spiritual gifts. And especially as you may prophesy. That's what chapter 14 is all about, how prophecy and tongues interpretation, how they're to operate in the church. One more verse on that, 1 Corinthians 14, 39. It says, therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak with tongues. So it's okay to desire spiritual gifts. It's okay to desire to give a prophetic word. There's nothing wrong with that. All right, next, we're going to look at discerning of spirits. <clears throat> Excuse me. Supernatural insight into the spirit realm to distinguish the motivating spirit behind words or deeds. Okay, it's not, it's not the, uh, the, 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 the gift of suspicion, right? It's, it's the discerning of spirits. It's not you know, trying to judge somebody else. It's trying to decide what spirit is motivating what's going on here today, whether it's people talking or some actions taking place. We want to know what's the spirit behind it. And there's kind of three major sources, right? Either God can be behind it. There's obviously a devil, and he does have some limited powers and abilities. And there are also human spirits. The Bible talks about how men, some of the prophets, that they spoke out of their own spirit. It wasn't the spirit of God. So the sermon means to separate, to decide what, what, is, what is right, what is wrong here. Um, so it's, uh, it's not to, to get the discernment, but we discern the spirit that's motivating something. And it's only possible by the Holy Spirit. Peter demonstrated this in Acts 5.3, the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land? They sold land. Uh, they uh, made like it was they were giving all the money. It was their land. They didn't have to sell it. They could have given part of the money, but they were pretending that they were giving all the money. And Peter discerned that that's a lying spirit there. He was able to discern that, and they were judged by that. Demonstrated by Paul in Acts 16. 16 to 18 says, Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, people ever annoy you? She was annoying. Right? She was just annoying. She was, Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. To me, it's kind of encouraging here is that, first of all, how come Paul didn't get it the first time? Why did it take several days? So it makes me feel better. Well, I don't always get things the first time, right? This is the great, the great Apostle Paul. The, the, well, I won't say that, but a lot of people almost esteem him. Never mind. But anyway, so Paul, he, if he could mess up, or if it took him a while to get it, I could be, duh, I don't always get things the first time God brings something to me, right? I, I don't have to give up on myself. Paul took several days. And notice, the lady had a right word. It was accurate. It wasn't inaccurate. It was accurate. So you can have a false prophet with a true word. And in New Testament times, now not in Old Testament times, but in New Testament times, you could have a true prophet with a false word. That knocks some people over. You know, there's some very godly, I'll just put very godly people that are very visible. A lot of you esteem, they're on TV and written books. But they teach things that we totally disagree with. Godly men, but they don't believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They don't believe that women should be pastors or minister. Uh, they believe that once you're saved, you're always saved. It doesn't matter what you do. Now, we don't call them false teachers, do we? but we don't agree with those teachings. So you can be a good teacher of the word, but you have some areas where you're, you're wrong. And same thing with New Testament prophets. The Old Testament, you had to get it right or you were out. You were gone. But in New Testament time, that's why we're to evaluate prophecy. Uh, also demonstrated by Jesus, lastly, Matthew 16. Um, then Peter took him aside 
and began to rebuke Jesus. This is right after Jesus had asked all of his apostles, hey guys, who, who are people saying that I am? And some good people saying, well, you're, some people think you're John the Baptist, come back. Some people think you're Elijah, blah, blah, blah. And Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, God has revealed that to you. So Peter had to be thinking, yeah, man, see, I, <clears throat> I can hear from God. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty anointed. And then a couple verses later, Jesus starts talking about how he's going to die on the cross. And Peter goes, <clears throat> come here. I'm sorry. He says, you know, that's, no, that ain't, that ain't going to happen. We got, and he went from having a revelation from God. And Jesus turns to him and said, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Now, fortunately, Peter did something right. Says he pulled Jesus aside. He didn't do this in front of everybody else. So what did Jesus do? He said, okay, thanks, Peter. Hey, by the way, you're full of the devil, right? But he didn't do it in front of everybody, right? He didn't do it in front of everybody. So, again, the uh, discerning spirits is not, you know, not to get the discernment, but it's being able to understand what spirit is motivating what's taking place. Pastor Russell. Thank you, Pastor Rick. The next thing that we're going to be looking at, the next gift, is various tongues. You may have heard it called glossolalia. Now, that's what that's the technical word for speaking in tongues. Greek gloss, glossa means tongue, and lala means talking, so tongue talking. That's the spiritual capability to express praise and worship to God in an unknown spiritual language. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2 says, For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. So tongues are a worship of and a praise to God. Tongues are also a sign. I want you to listen to this. 1 Corinthians 14, 22. So then tongues are for a sign. That's what I just said. Tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophecy is a sign, not to unbelievers, but to those who believe. So, these different gifts, and that gift of tongues, it's a sign for the unbeliever. There's also a gift of interpretation of tongues, the spiritual capability to make known to the body the message of one who is speaking in tongues. Now, this is different than praying in the Spirit. When a tongue or pro uh, is a proclamation of the glory of God to the church, there are times when we're worshiping God and you hear people praying in their spiritual language. There are times when we're praying and you hear people praying in their spiritual language. That's what that is. It's, it's praise and prayer in their spiritual language, but the, the gift of tongues is a gift where it's a proclamation to the body of the glory of God to the church. With that, interpretation is necessary. For 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 says, So I ask you to make full use of the gift that God has given you when I place my hands on you. Use it well. God's Spirit doesn't make cowards out of us. So the Spirit gives us power, love, and self-control. And we're able to, to proclaim, to, to translate, as it were, those spiritual messages of praise and worship to God. And so Josh, if you just put in some closing music there, it comes down to the fact of why are gifts sometimes difficult for me to embrace. Why are the gifts of the Spirit? So did, I'll be honest with you. How many of you have heard of Brownsville? In the Brownsville Revival. Okay, I got to go to that. And if, if you've heard this story before, please bear with me. But I just got to Mississippi. Brother Al said, hey, take the teenagers over. He said, I haven't been there. I don't know what it is. So I went. And right away we got in. Now this will sound odd to you, but there was there were people there. There was one lady in particular that when she, when I saw her in the building, she she, she was shaking. And I 
kind of puffed out my chest inside my spirit and said, that's not God. And the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, pretty sure of yourself, aren't you? How do you know? That's a good question. I don't see it anywhere in the Bible that says it is. I didn't see anywhere that says it isn't. I know there would be different things and different people respond in different ways. So I thought, you know what, God, if this is not you, then wear her out. That's a pretty good litmus test, isn't it? I mean, try it sometimes, sit there and shake. And we had to get there two hours before service started just to get seats. And then the service was two hours, and then you had an altar call. It lasted a long time. So, whole time, didn't break a sweat. Wow, God, that must be you. There's also a little girl that came with me in the youth group, and I'd only been there a few weeks, so I really didn't know kids well, and I didn't realize that she didn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. She just had a relationship with other kids in the youth group. So when we got there and walked in, sat down, and she saw the other lady, she started doing it. And I, I thought, oh, come on. And God said, are you sure? And I said, okay, God, if this isn't you, wear her out. No kidding. Ten minutes max, she was running with sweat, and she gave up. Hmm. I saw a lot of things. I got back to the church, and Brother Al, the next morning, Sunday morning, said, What'd you think? Was it revival? I said, well, Brother Al, I have never seen something so incredible and something so ridiculous. I said, I've never seen so many manifestations and so many men in flesh stations. I said, it must be revival. He said, that's the best analogy of revival I've ever heard in my life. And as we consider, why is it that... that the gifts sometimes are difficult for us to embrace. As I mentioned before, misuse. How does misuse occur? Well, I can tell you sometimes it's a person that really, really is overwhelmed by the presence of God and just, you ever been overwhelmed when you spoke out something and thought, oh! I've done that quite often in my life and thought, oh, I should have kept my mouth shut. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes, going, going along with that, or other times, it's a person that's overwhelmed by the presence of God and, and just stepping out in faith. They think it's something that they're supposed to do, but they're not. But they're trying. And then there are those who are correctly using the gifts and speaking out and operating in them, but then at the end they embellish. I'm not going to ask how many have seen that before. They, God gives a good word through them, and when it's done, they don't think it should be done. They just need to put an exclamation mark on it. Those are all examples of people making an effort, and I believe that God applauds their effort. God appreciates them stepping out. The main problem, though, is when Satan is allowed to participate in what we would call the gifts. Let me tell you something. Satan cannot create gifts. All he can, he can't create anything. Think about it. He cannot create anything. All he can do is pervert. And we could go through and I could ask different people, what have you seen that was a misuse of the gifts? We've all seen something where someone was, was just, it wasn't of God. So how should the gifts be used? And as we consider the fact that we are not to fear the gifts, then how should they be used? 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1. Love should be your God. Do you love me? Then let the Spirit work through you and produce gifts that benefit you. 
Do you love the person next to you? Then let the Holy Spirit give you gifts and work in those gifts to bless them. Love should be your guide. Be eager to have the gifts that come from the Holy Spirit, especially the gift of prophecy. If you speak a language that others don't know, God will understand what you're saying, though no one else will know what you mean. You will be ta talking about mysteries that only the Spirit understands, but when you prophesy, oh, you will be understood and others will be helped. They will be encouraged, listen to this, and made to feel better. That's how we operate in the gifts of the Spirit. And that's what the Scripture... I, I know, we've all had our own experiences. We all lean on, well, when I was back in the day when my rose-colored glasses were looking at everything and it was beautiful, this is how they did it. Listen to me. It's a hard job to pastor a Pentecostal church right now. It's much easier to say, no Holy Spirit in the morning service. We'll do it in a Sunday school class or in a private setting because people will get confused. No, what that means is I'm too lazy. Those on Facebook, I love you. Because <laughs> this is going to get sent somewhere. <laughs> You feel it? That's too lazy to do the work of a pastor of a Pentecostal church. When you relegate, listen to me. I love Jesus Christ and I love the Holy Spirit. If I relegate the Holy Spirit away from our gathering, you need to get rid of me. Because it's the same as if I relegate Jesus Christ somewhere away from our gathering. It all comes down to operating correctly in the gifts of the Spirit. And this morning, I am making a deal with you. I am going to do my best to make sure that whatever gift God has given you, that I will help you to see that developed and come to and I will do my best to make a safe place for you to walk in that gift. You may call it practice that gift, whatever you want to call it. And we will work together because the Spirit of God, all things are possible with God. And the Spirit of God in it, let's, let's start operating in the gifts of the Spirit. Let's start, and, and listen to me, it's not just for the church house. The gifts of the Spirit are for the marketplace. They're for the workplace. Let me tell you, when I was juvenile probation officer and I'd walk down the school, the high school hallway, I would hear it, the kid, it, it was funny because a lot of the kids didn't know who I was. And for a guy that looks like Howdy Doody and bad guys are scared to death of him. <laughs> and kids are looking at me like, well, if the bad guy is scared of him, then I am too. So I'd hear whispers and different things. I, I, it's okay. I'm cool. I'm walking along. And I'd hear, Mr. Foley. Mr. Foley. And I'd look over and there'd be a teacher around the, the corner of the hallway. And I'd stop. And I'm like, oh, yes, ma'am. Would, would you pray for me? Yeah. Yeah, let me pray for you. Why? Because they saw the gifts of the Spirit working in my life. Why? Because I'm sure that principal was saying, you know what that probation officer did? Pulled a rabbit out of a hat. And he wasn't even Simon, the sorcerer. Word gets around when you start operating in the gifts where you work. Those people need to know that the gifts of the Spirit are alive in you. Because they're going to come in Monday morning. And they're going to have they're going to have a bad day. If they don't have Jesus Christ, that's what's going to happen. Trust me. They're going to come in and have a bad day. And sometimes they'll see you having a good day and it'll make them mad. But the day is coming when, when your spirit 
is going to start testifying somehow through the gifts. And they're going to say, I, can we talk? Can you pray for me? Or even, there, there's, there's a lot of, I'm, I pray for a lot of people in our community who don't even know I'm praying for them. But I know the Holy Spirit is working in them, and he's going to bring it to fruition. But we've got to operate in those gifts knowing that they will come eventually. And I may not even see it in this life. It may not be until I get to heaven. But I'm praying through the power of the Spirit, laying them on my heart, and I'm praying what he's saying. And when he opens the door, I speak that into their life. When I, when I call up my buddy John and say, hey, John, you know I'm praying for you every day. God laid you on my heart to, to call you. What's going on? And he says, man, every time I'm going through it, you call. What is that? And I tell him, that's the Holy Spirit, John. This morning, God wants to work that way in you. You, you have gifts. The question is, have you found yourself unwilling to operate in the gifts of the Spirit? Has it seemed uncomfortable or unnatural to you so you've stepped back? This morning and this week, we are going to pray every day that we'll receive a new understanding. What was said this morning, the reset. We're going to get a new understanding because every day this week, we're going to go to the Lord and say, Holy Spirit, help me to embrace the gift that you're giving. And help me to operate in that gift so I can be a blessing and encouragement and uplift to those around me. That's what I want to do. Will you join me this week? And let me tell you something. We're getting ready in two weeks to celebrate the greatest event in history. The greatest event in history. We're going to celebrate it. And it's not just a day to come together for a special service. We're going to celebrate. And there are people that need to know that this was the greatest day in history when Jesus rose from the dead. He conquered death, hell, and the grave. And he's gone to prepare a place for you and me. And he's coming back for us so that we can be with God forever. The greatest event ever to take place to, to this point, Jesus Christ rising from the dead. If you haven't invited someone to come and celebrate with you that needs to know Jesus Christ, let me say that again. If you haven't invited someone to come and celebrate with you who does not know Jesus Christ, then you need to pray for forgiveness. Scripture says, Selah, let that sink in. The Holy Spirit wants to use you. You've got to step into that gift. You've got to step into that opportunity. And I am telling you, trust me when I say this, when you step in, he is there already. He will bless what you're doing. Even if you fall down, he will pick you up. He might even chuckle a little. But he will pick you up. He will put his arm around you. Say, that was so good. Let's try it again. And you will be blessed. You will be strengthened. And you will be used of God. And there is nothing in this world I want more than to be used of God. The only thing close to that is helping you to be used of God. If you will agree with me, if you will covenant with me, that's heavy duty stuff. If you will covenant with me that this week you and I will pray that the Holy Spirit will be made new to you and his gift for your life will become obvious and you will begin walking in that gift. 
Trust me, we will have the greatest Resurrection Sunday we have ever had. This morning, we're going to begin this week's prayer right here. And it's going to carry on this week. And the Holy Spirit is going to amaze you at what he's going to do. Father, as we come before you today, we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that raised him from the dead, giving life and life abundantly to all of us who receive, and the great joy and eternal hope of heaven for us as we've been washed in the blood of the Lamb and we live for you. Now, Father, I ask, just as you gave your Son for us, I ask that Jesus would send the Comforter. And that we would be baptized in the Spirit of God. And the power of His Spirit would move through us. And those gifts that have already been planted within us would sprout. Would come alive. And would grow and develop and become. Father, every day this week, may our keystone prayer be that you would help us to walk in the Spirit of God. That we would recognize it's not by might, it's not by power, it's by your Spirit. That's what you said. Lord, that we would be changed for an eternity and that your spirit would work through us to bring life and encouragement to those around us. Now, Father, I speak that blessing of all the blessings I've spoken into the lives of this congregation. I speak the blessing of the newness of the Spirit of God. I speak a joy unspeakable and full of glory. I count it as done now that blessing in Jesus' name. And everyone that received that said, Amen. 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 God is going to bless that. And before we leave, we're gonna, we always receive an offering at the end. We're still in COVID mode for receiving offerings and the offering plates at the back. We're going to make our offering proclamation together today. Before we do, I just wanted to make mention that the youth group are raising money for Speed the Light. This is called Bunny Bait. If there's anything that's considered an Easter bunny that comes to your house and you want to catch it, this is it. Uh, it's, 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 gonna, it's 100% profit. Everything has been donated to the youth. They did the labor to put it together. We're asking $3 a piece, if you would, to give them and put them out because you want to catch that bunny, bunny bait. And all the money, every cent that comes in, will go to Speed the Light, how we put our missionaries on the road, whether it's a bicycle, whether it's a motorcycle, whether it's an airplane, whether it's a van. So our young people will be out there for that. Now we're going to receive our offering. Father, I, Father, I, I sow my finances into the kingdom of God. The gospel will be preached in all the world. Lives will be set free and the kingdom of Satan will be stopped. It will produce for God and for me good measure. Pressed down, shaken together and running over. I count it as done in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Lord bless you. As Pastor Rick mentioned, youth tonight at five in the youth room. Ladies tonight at five in the fellowship hall. We're going we're gonna to see a great event happen here tonight as people come back together and let their gifts flow. Lord bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Oh, and don't forget the cards. This